and welcome to 21 Conversations, the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I am Paula Pierce, one of the board members of Greensboro Literary Organization. Greensboro Bound is so excited to present to you these 21 Conversations, our effort to create something unique and special for our community within the confines of our continued virtual environment. 21 Conversations plays homage to North Carolina's rich literary history while broadening our tent to welcome in voices from outside our own microcosm of experience. This featured presentation is but a taste of the 52 authors that we have gathered together in a series of delightful, sometimes unexpected, but always edifying conversations. Since our inception, Greensboro Bound has been committed to providing programs like the one you are about to watch, 100% free to our community. In order to do that, we need the financial support, both big and small, of readers just like you. Please support Greensboro Bound by giving now. The text to give phone number, as well as our website are on your screen. A sustaining gift of just $15 a month or the cost of a single children's book will help us remain financially solvent throughout the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sustaining supporters without whom Greensboro Bound would not be possible. Our utmost gratitude to the Edward M. Armfield Senior Foundation, the Roof Lands Memorial Fund, and Arts Greensboro for their support continued belief in our vision to bring together readers and writers of all genres, ages, ethnicities, identities, and voices to foster an understanding of writing, a process that allows free expression, deepens critical thought, and helps sustain a culture of inquiry and delight that is open to all. Thank you again for joining us for the 21 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Please enjoy the conversation. Welcome everyone to our session here at Greensboro Bound. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled to have friends and writers uh, to, to chat with today uh, and to have a, a wide ranging discussion about uh, their fiction, the state of fiction, all kinds of good things. I'm gonna start by um, doing some quick introduction, uh, uh, introductions of our panelists beginning with my friend and co-host, Amy Weldon. Uh, Amy is a brilliant and widely published writer of both fiction and nonfiction. She's one of the most beloved professors at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, where she leads her students with the same kind of bright vision and curiosity that she brings to her prose. She takes them on globetrotting literary expeditions to Italy and the UK. She can teach you all about the British romantics. Uh, but more than that, she shares their imagination. Her novel in progress, Creature, is based on the life of Mary Shelley. And having read some of it, I am counting down the days till it is in print. Her three books offer a masterclass in writing 
and living with humanity in our times. And actually, her novel, El Dorado, Iowa, shares something in common with the novels you'll hear about today. At its core, there's a mystery surrounding a disappearance. That's a bit about Amy to introduce myself. I'm Brian Gemza. Uh, I am a Greensboro native and pleased to be involved with Greensboro uh, Bound. Uh, once again, uh, it's been a pleasure to see the festival grow through the years. I too am a writer of fiction and nonfiction. I've just finished a nonfiction book about uh, disinformation and uh, I'm working on another book right now about uh, fiction and science, and I have uh, a novel in progress. So um, to get to our, our core panelists, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, an introduction of uh, my, my friend, Dennis McCarthy, uh, who has managed to pack a number of lifetimes uh, into his years. Um, Dennis grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, an early chapter of his career was as a park ranger on the storied koala boundary there in the Smoky Mountains. He had the good sense and wisdom to meet and marry and eventually practice law with his brilliant wife, Judy. Along the way, Dennis has been an ecologist for the Tennessee Valley Authority, a speechwriter, an editor in chief, and a frequent professor he currently lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, in a home with a view of the mountains <clears throat> and with an intrepid beagle who leaves earprints and footprints in the frequent dustings of snow there. Dennis is what my grandfather always referred to as a gentleman and a scholar. He has a profound and compassionate curiosity about what's sacred in other people. He's been deeply interested in the profound themes of human spirituality including Buddhism and Catholic monasticism. And his delightful debut novel, The Gospel According to Billy the Kid, which was published by the University of New Mexico Press, reflects that deep and abiding curiosity. Uh, let's switch over to Amy D to hear about John Hart. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to introduce um, the two-time Edgar Award winner and author of seven New York Times best-selling thriller novels, John Hart, um, who is also a North Carolina native and um, a, a very brave man, not only because he's writing, writing books, which is in itself um, somewhat of a brave and risky endeavor, but because he did something that I think um, many people secretly dream of doing, but few are seldom able to make possible, which is um, John was a stockbroker. Um, uh, John was a stockbroker and with the support of his wife, Katie, um, decided to embark on a writing career full time um, and has spoken elsewhere about the personal, spiritual, creative risks that this involves. Um, Yet, I think uh, his, his legions of loyal readers would agree that um, this is an effort that has paid off. Um, I am looking forward to um, talking to John um, along with our other distinguished panelists and learning more um, about his work today. Thanks, Amy. And we have uh, a, a final introduction to make here with Rod Davis, who uh, seems also to have packed uh, some lifetimes into the space of decades. Uh, Rod has been an officer in the Army. Uh, he's been involved in supporting veterans in various capacities, including, for example, by launching and directing the Texas A&M University System's first veteran support office. He's been an investigative journalist. He's taught writing at the University of Texas at Austin and SMU in Dallas. And at some point, uh, we probably owe him thanks because he's almost certainly edited something that we've read, uh, whether with the AP, whether it was Cooking Light or Dallas Magazine or American Way. Uh, if that last one rings a bell, 
It's the American Airlines magazine that you might have thumbed through while your seat was in the upright position. Uh, Rod has published his own award-winning work uh, widely in a dozen popular magazines. Uh, and interestingly, he's written a nonfiction study of voodoo, which might be relevant to our discussion of his latest novel, East of Texas, West of Hell, the second installment in his uh, Jack Prine series. So welcome all. We have a, a big uh, panel. We have a, a lot to talk about. Uh, let's let's get right to it. This this is uh, gonna gonna be fun. Um, Amy, would you like to get us started? The it, first question. It would be my pleasure, Brian. Thank you. So welcome again um, to all of our wonderful writers today. Um, I would like to invite each of you to um, start a bit by building on what we have just said about each of you. Um, what else should we have said? Um, in other words, Brian uh, spoke, I think, very well and helpfully about the fact that each of you is, a, is someone who brings several lifetimes worth of experience to your work as writers um, and your lives on the page. Um, how, how, would you, how would you like to tell viewers about um, intersections between your life and your writing, or if that seems a little um, broad of a question, which I can totally understand, what might be a typical day? Um, what does a typical day in your writing life look like? Rod, can we start with you? A typical day in my writing life would be pretty boring. I'll try to uh, think, made me think what are the intersections uh, of writing with my life, because I, I actually last week uh, tallied up all the places I've lived uh, since I was born. And there are uh, at least 35 cities and probably at least 50 re uh, addresses. So my it came because my tax guy said, I told him I might be moving again next year. And he said, you're nothing but a rolling stone. And it turns out uh, I've tried, I've lived, uh, I've moved every two years on the average, I might as well have gone into the foreign service and uh, changed addresses every 1.5 years. So uh, travel and place, I think has become an important part of my writing because I'm very aware of, mostly I've lived in the South, but I mean, it's become a very important part of my writing because I recognize the influence of where you live and the people you meet where you live on your development as a person uh, and consequently as a writer. So uh, that's why I, you know, both of my, uh, uh, I call them Southern noir novels are, have a lot of travel in them. And, uh, and I think that's because that's, I didn't consciously do that. It just sort of came out. And, and, and I realized that was important to me to move people around and have different experiences based on sense of place. And so that also accounts for a lot of my different jobs that I've had and just about any kind of media you could have. I was like one of the first three hires of the Texas Film Commission back when we first started. And it was like, we didn't really know what we were doing. One of us, Warren Scarron became, he, he got involved in Batman and uh, some of the big movies and uh, left us, but I, I, I didn't like the movie business. So I got out of it pretty quickly. And, but I think now uh, movement, travel, change, uh, that's where it intersects in a lot of stuff I write. I'm not comfortable leaving somebody in the same place, just as apparently I'm not comfortable in leaving myself in the same place, but I do want to do better now on that part. So. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, what would you like to add? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. John has talked about the number of places that he lived and I thought I'd lived in a number of places. I know at one point when my wife and I had been married for about 15 years, I started counting up the number of addresses we'd had. And in that 15 years, we had uh, 15 major moves and three minor moves. And I thought that was a lot, but, <laughs> but I can't even come close to John because 
Judy and I have settled down. And uh, frankly, I like the fact that we've settled down now. Uh, we've been living here in Santa Fe now for, oh, the uh, last 10 years, I guess. And uh, my kids keep asking me, when are you going to come back east? My son lives, our son lives in Atlanta and my, our daughter lives in New York. And, uh, and what I am inclined to tell them, but don't want to, is I would never cross the Mississippi River again if I had, if it weren't for my kids. Uh, we, we like it here and we're settled in. And, and certainly this has had a huge impact on, on my writing itself because uh, when, he, uh, when Brian was talking about the various things I've done, at, at one time or another, I thought I was, I was a cat. I had nine lives because I've had at least nine careers. Um, but if I were starting over again, um, I would move into the Southwest and I would write about the Southwest and I, this would be, I, I could spend a, a lifetime here. It's just, it's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful environment, wonderful characters, wonderful people, wonderful stories. And all those, certainly they've shaped uh, this particular book that, uh, that, uh, that we're talking about today. I can't wait to hear more about that. Thank you. John? Tell us about your story. Well, so I love talking about individual books, but what I find fascinating is the writing journey and the writers that that walk it. Um, one of the things I love about doing panels like this is that everyone here involved has actually written the book. You know, they put their backside in the seat and gotten it done. And I suspect we've all met countless people that have it all figured out up here, but they just need to get it down on paper. Well, that's the tricky part, isn't it? So, um, I like to look at, at the journey that brought me here and, and sort of in these terms, um, you know, my mother's very proud, which is a lovely thing for your parent to be proud of you. And someone asked me once, and it may have been my mother, um, you know, if I felt the same way. And I really had to think about this because what am I proud of uh, here with seven books in the world and, and deep into writing number eight? Uh, whatever talent I may or may not have, I think is God given. Um, you know, I, I sort of found it. I worked hard to discover it, but that's not what makes me proud. What makes me proud is that every time I could make the easy choice or the difficult choice, I, I made the difficult choice to pursue the dream of being a full-time writer. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you mentioned my time as a stockbroker. That was that was only the the last little chapter. I often refer to my uh, road to publication as my 15-year overnight success story, and that's kind of what it felt like. I outlined my first novel when I was 20. It never got off the cocktail napkins, but I knew then that I wanted to, to do this. Um, I ended up doing a master's in accounting when I was 27. Don't ask me why. That was a miserable chapter in my life. I don't doubt there's a writer alive that's supposed to be studying accounting. I just, that's, those things don't go hand in hand. Um, but it, it forced me to stop talking about writing a book and do this hard thing and, and actually write it. And it was widely unpublished. It remains widely unpublished. Uh, I wrote a second one while I was in law school, equally unpublished. Um, but, you know, it's hard to do graduate school and write novels. And uh, I found myself as a criminal defense attorney with a stay at home wife and a young child um, and planning on child number two. And I realized that if I wanted to take one more swing for the fences, this was it. So uh, I walked away from my law practice and wrote for a year just so I could say this is what I'm doing, just writing. And uh, I was in a new job as a stockbroker four years later when I when the book finally came out. And it was based, I mean, it was, I'll tell you, it was a tiny advance. I mean, my advance for that first novel was $7,500. And um, it seemed like I'd given up a lot to earn $7,500. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, you know, I walked away from my stockbroking job and I was the best money I'd ever made, but I, I had a contract and I, I wanted to write more. And so there have been countless times where I could have said, you know, this is not safe. And yet I always took the chance um, and, and I could go on at, at length about all the risks involved. But that, that's what I'm most proud of. And I think that that's the purpose of this whole writer journey is to never lose sight of the vision and to sacrifice what is required in pursuit of it. Thank you. I would agree with that. Thank you all very much. Hey, well. Let, let's uh, turn to uh, some of the common ground here uh, between these works. 
Uh, and it, it, it's fascinating to hear about the common ground uh, that you have as writers, too, because, of course, there's a common misconception that, uh, you know, you just become a writer and, and that's what you do. Uh, I think it's inspiring to hear about the, the many different paths uh, that led to your work as writers and to the, the books that we'll, we'll be talking about today. Um, we actually uh, discovered one common theme uh, before the recording started, which is um, uh, there, there's 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 some violence here. Uh, we're, we're, we can uh, what we realized is that uh, basically John and Rod like their body parts frozen. Um, Dennis <laughs> likes his served, uh, I guess, organic, uh, fresh. Um, so um, I want to dip into that a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, tell a story from my friend John Reed, um, who was part of a team of sociologists uh, that was surveying the public to figure out why Southerners uh, were more accepting of things like capital punishment and physical violence. Uh, and uh, they're calling people up and asking these questions. And, and one respondent said, well, it, it's not that we're more violent. It's just that there are more people around here who need killing. <laughs> so um, it turns out across these books, and I think we can pull that, we can extend this into the culture of the Southwest with Billy the Kid. Uh, there are some people who need killing, I guess. Um, and in Rod and John's books, we have uh, main characters who sometimes want to kill other people. Uh, we certainly have some violence across these books in the gospel. According to Billy the Kid, we have a protagonist, a famous killer, a gunslinger who kind of has to come to terms with a violent life. So I want to know, what's the story, y'all? Um, maybe you could speak to what violence means in your work and also how you work to keep it from being uh, stereotypical or ill-considered or wrote. Tell us a little bit about that hard-bitten quality of, of these books. Uh, and actually, why don't, we, why don't we start out across the Mississippi? Uh, let's, maybe you can get us started, uh, Dennis, with the nature of violence in Billy the Kid. Well, we're, we're all animals. Okay? It's part of our basic biology. And as animals, there's a huge violent uh, component of it. If, uh, if you're a tiger, if you're a lion, if you're a wolf, uh, if you're a jaguar, if you're a mouse even, uh, you know, you eat things. And there's, there's no way getting around eating things, killing things. It's just, it's just part of the basic biology. You have to survive in order to do it. And humans are just as much uh, animals as all the, the natural world that we see. So violence is built into our DNA. Uh, we can't get away from it. Uh, as human beings, we try to aspire to something more. And uh, we, we try to put some kind of meaning into life and we try somehow or other to uh, uh, make ourselves what we consider human. Uh, and um, as you look at the uh, the stories, my story, for example, uh, Billy, he's struggling with that. He's struggling with the fact that, you know, that there are bad things going on and he has to do something about it. But what, uh, how is he going to go, go beyond that? How is he going to reach out? Where's the kindness? You know, at one point, he, uh, one of the monks asks him, you know, talks to him about kindness. And he says, well, you know, Kindness is not, there's not a way much that you can survive with kindness around here. Well, yes and no. And so, you know, kindness and love are parts of, they're part of our biology. And one of the wonderful things that's come out through the, uh, uh, the computer age that we live in and, and all the videos and so on, my wife uh, every morning goes through uh, a whole series of pictures and, and every Friday and Saturday evening, she shows them to me. And they're extraordinary pictures of, of kindness, of compassion, of love, of animals. And they're not just of animals um, 
you know, it's not just a wolf against a wolf or a snake against a snake. Sometimes, sometimes it's a predator showing kindness and compassion to uh, a um, a total to a prey species. So, you know, this is all part of our natural biology. It's all part of our DNA. And yes, it's it's an obvious thing that's going to come out in in our novels and. Uh, uh, even the characters that have come up in in uh, Rod and, and John's novels, even even the bad guys, you know, there's enormous amount of compassion in them. Uh, X, John is one of the uh, more vicious characters that I've encountered in uh, literature, but he has a heart too, and and in the end, it kind of comes through, you know. So you know, you could look at X and you say he's a, you know, he's almost a uh, a Hitler type character. But there's a goodness in him too, and you know, all of this comes out, and it's it's just it's part of who we are. Yeah, maybe you could pick it up from from there, John, because X is a, a very memorable uh, villain, and uh, he seems to embody that uh, uh, almost animal love of of violence. Tell us more about that. Well, uh, you know, I, I think Dennis um, speaks eloquently of um, the human nature and the violence um, that has been part of our species for so long. Um, I think what's fascinating is because we are trying to evolve beyond that. We're trying to move into a higher plane and, and failing to escape that innate biology. There is a, um, an enduring fascination with violence. Um, you know, those of us who choose to not be violent people and that, you know, thankfully I think that that's most of us. I mean, I won't speak to our dreams or fantasies or uh, those sorts of things, but we behave in a civilized manner. And I think that that's a really uh, important thing. And yet as a writer trying to speak to readers and tell stories that people want to read and tell their friends about, it's really important to, to recognize what, um, you know, what excites a reader. No, nobody really wants to spend um, a day sitting on the beach reading about a uh, happy family shopping uh, for Mother's Day. You know, they, they really don't. They want to read about the things that fascinate. It's one of the reasons I like writing about dysfunctional families because they're fascinating. And I like writing about the South because those who don't know the South, it is fascinating. The South is in a state of constant change even now. Um, but in terms of the violence, um, uh, I think it was Jocelyn Jackson. And I steal this quote all the time. She's a Southern writer. And she said that um, one of the best ways to introduce your readers to the characters that you've built is to lock those characters in a room and light one of them on fire. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, somebody's going to panic. Somebody's going to beat their fist bloody on the door. And hopefully somebody's going to put out the fire. But we don't know until the heat is turned up on these characters what they're going to do. And so violence is a really wonderful way to, to cook away the soft veneer that we've all learned to adapt uh, as members of polite society and then explore the questions of what will they do? Why do they do it? And what are the repercussions of that action? So uh, violence for me as a writer is just a great way to get deeper into the character because it affects everyone around it. It affects the person committing it. It affects the person who suffers from it, the lives of those uh, connected to those people. So um, the character of X, I mean, I, I took a lot of chances with him. He is a pretty <laughs> terrifying guy. In my mind, he's the most dangerous man alive. That's how I describe him. Um, and it's probably the first time I've really walked on the side of you know, truly over the top characterizations um, because he is so much larger than life. But the that little kernel of humanity that Dennis uh, keyed on was so important as well, because really good literature it recognizes the fact that um, we're all complex and there are all these moving parts and we're never just one thing, no matter what anyone thinks about us. Well, I feel like that really tees it up for, for, for Rod. Uh, what, what's your take on this, Rod? Is, is, are, are you working with characters under pressure to see what happens as well? Uh, and I might ask along with that, do you know uh, where your, your book is going to go? Or are you on a guided journey uh, where you uh, discover what the characters want to be and do in response to violence? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I would like, especially like to answer that last one. I want to say regarding violence in general, if, if you think about it, uh, Beowulf, Shakespeare, you pretty much name it, uh, has been a theme for uh, 
I suppose, as John was talking about, revealing who the characters really are under that kind of duress. And uh, we identify with some, we hate some, uh, we dismiss some, whatever. So I, I would say, while uh, uh, crime fiction in general, sort of by the way it is, has a lot of violence in it. And if you don't like, and I've had people say your novel is too violent. And I'm saying, well, maybe this isn't the one for you to read. But if you pick it up, you might expect something like that in there. Uh, but what I found out is that I, I have thought about violence and life and death a lot in my life. Uh, and because when I was attracted, my first book was a nonfiction book called American Voodoo. And that got me into uh, death and, and religion and uh, thought a lot about that at that point as well and racism and all the stuff that you encounter. But uh, I liked the idea of crime fiction, what I now call noir that I, that I would say I do, uh, because it, it allows you to use the, the really prime movers and stoppers in our world to explicate characters. And so I, I find myself interested in those kinds of stories, even though I, I don't want to get involved in that you know, myself uh in any way but uh so I, I think this is characteristic of what we're all doing here uh but what happened to me and i thought that you might find this interesting is uh since my book came out in 2020 the worst year ever to bring a book out may i just say but uh i've been to a few of these kinds of conferences and i was at one last last week uh out of san antonio where i used to live <clears throat> Uh, a writer's uh, project there called Gemini Inc. Uh, it's pretty well known in the city, hosts something called Knights of Noir. And so uh, they had me on as a guest to talk about my novel. And in the course of the conversation, uh, somebody mentioned how my first book, which is called South Com America, by the way, never do that in a title because I don't know how many thousands of inquiries I used to have on Amazon looking for a travel book, but it was, it introduced this character, Jack Prine, uh, whom I did name after John Prine. And we have a little acknowledgement of that in, in this book because he, he died of COVID, as you know. Uh, and somebody said, well, when, when we first met Jack Prine, he, he got kind of got caught up into this search to, to uh, avenge the death of, of someone. And that's what propelled the novel throughout uh, his journeys around the South, out of New Orleans and moving into that. He said, but in the second novel, uh, we see something different about him. And I hadn't really thought about this, that the effects of this on Jack, especially this, because this piece of Texas became much more violent uh, than the first one was in an account, because it counter cartels and horrible people and so on. And, and, uh, and by the end, it had shown its effects on him. And I, so sometimes when you write something, you're not completely aware of how, I'm aware of how I feel about it, but I'm not completely aware about how others will see it. So this came up to me and I thought, no, that's a very good point. And if I could, I read like a very short paragraph here right at the very end, because this is where uh, Jack Prine came to at the end of the second book. Uh, as a result of all this violence he'd been involved in. And as you say, some of it quite willing, you know, he didn't mind shooting a guy in a meth lab, even though he didn't know, somebody told me, well, they, he, how, how would he know he was a meth cook? And I said, he was in a freaking trailer cooking mess. Uh, so did he mind shooting him? I said, I wouldn't mind shooting a meth cooker. So I didn't have a problem with it, but that's where he was getting. And by the end, all this has happened, piled up on him and he just reflects, <clears throat> All that I had learned after fortnight of killing in the name of a mother's love and righteous vengeance was that William's rule, this is someone he met, applied there too. Good can come from bad and the reverse. The trick is in the balance. I would never know that what lay amid what I had witnessed and wrought. But I did know one thing. Death and life are relentless in their paths. People break, hell they disintegrate. Uh, and so, I can certainly see that in your in your book, John. What's happening to some of your characters too, uh, and and maybe anybody that really. I'm sorry, Dennis. I haven't been able to read yours yet, but I, 
I, I know if you're really serious about using this and dealing with this issue, unless you're spirit dead in your head somewhere, it's gonna have some effect maybe on you as the writer and therefore on your characters. And, and to your other question, I don't know where I'm going all the time. I had no idea what the ending of this book was gonna be when I started. I just had where it starts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had no idea would wind up, go, move from Atlanta to Savannah to Texas. Uh, but as I kept going, and I had some of the characters, I mean, one of the big characters is guy AK-47. I, I didn't really know he was even going to be in there uh, and, until it just sort of came to me. And then I thought, well, I'll develop this guy too. So I don't know. I bet you both go through this too. I'd be willing to bet that uh, you don't know <laughs> where it's going to end. And uh, I just read something today. Somebody posted on the internet uh, and damned if I can remember who said it, but it was a very important person uh, that if you know where it's going to end, why even do it? So uh, it was, and, and maybe that's a part of it. I think it keeps it fresh because otherwise we probably would be writing templates which I hope nobody ever really does. So speaking of um, Jack Prine, since we've just heard his voice, um, I will remark that sort of circling back to the idea of place in the South and the Southwest as well. Um, Jack Prine says at one point as he's driving um, that as he's, as he's crossing multiple states, listening to the radio, he notes that um, on the radio, the stories are never anything about us, us, us meaning the South. Um, and so I, I want to open it up a bit more to circle back to the idea of place. All of y'all were raised in the South um, and or the Southwest. Your roots are there. And in these books, um, the South and the Southwest are obviously very important. So um, if you'd like to say anything else about the importance of place, or region or what they give you to work with as writers, um, that would be wonderful, especially perhaps as the setting of thrillers. And it seems to me that the South as a setting for any book, but perhaps particularly a thriller, the South or the Southwest could be really wonderful, could also offer a lot of relatively formulaic pitfalls or potholes to dodge. So um, what have you found about using the South and the Southwest as a setting perhaps for your books in general or perhaps for thrillers or suspense novels in particular? Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that uh, just to begin with. We live in uh, a culture today that is worldwide. And certainly the culture in the United States is totally homogenized. I grew up in the South. I'm a little bit older than uh, John or Rod. And uh, so I grew up in an earlier part of the South than either of you fellas did. Oops. Robo calls. <laughs> I should have turned off my phone. Um, and growing up in that environment, the South was a real culture. It was before television. Well, television came in when I was in like the, you know, fifth or sixth grade. Uh, and it began fairly quickly to have some impact on the South. But early on, the South was still, it was still a real place. Uh, it was not a homogenized United States. I grew up in East Tennessee. I grew up in, in the mountainous areas. Uh, my neighbors were Appalachian people. They were Scotch-Irish. Uh, they were only, uh, you know, I, I could say they, they were several generations away from Elizabethan England. And in real time, they were several generations away. But culturally, they were not, you know, uh, that culture was still there, uh, you know, the language was still there. And uh, after television came and, and the homogenization of the country, all of that began to change. But the South still, it's still, there's still a little bit of that left. And there's, I think, uh, 
you know, I used to tell people the South was, was the last place of culture in the United States. Well, when I came to the Southwest, I discovered, no, that's not true. There's a real culture in the Southwest too. It's not this generalized, homogenized uh, worldwide culture, but, but it's a real place. And a real place, you have to have a real place. If you want to write real literature, it has to come out of a real place. It has to come out of, of real values. You know, there have to be things that, that spark people, that drive them to do what they do. Uh, and uh, we're losing that. We're losing that as a nation. And I think that's one of the reasons why the South has been so prolific in, uh, in producing such an extraordinary collection of, of novelists. I'll, I'll jump in on top of that, if you don't mind. Um, Dennis, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the country is being homogenized and I love being from the South. I love writing the South. Um, to me, the South speaks in a couple of ways. One, um, yes, we're losing some of that cultural memory. I'm old enough. I'm, I'm mid fifties. So, I mean, I, I don't have your specific memories, but I, you know, my, my parents did, my grandparents did. And, and I, I have some early childhood memories of red dirt roads that, uh, you know, have basically been eradicated in North Carolina for the simple fact that at one point we had, you know, we, we were embarrassed that we had so many and there was a conscious decision, well, we need to pave all these roads. Well, I think that's a shame. I, I love those red dirt roads. Um, but the South is a is a vanquished nation, if you think about it. I mean, it wasn't that long ago since the Civil War. Um, and we, you know, I, I think of West Virginia, for instance, that is so mineral rich, and yet most of those mineral rights are owned by people, you know, out of state. And so West Virginia is, is like one of the more oppressed places in the South. But there's this sense of shared history and loss that is, it's disappearing now. And, and I don't buy that it's all based in racism and um, you know, longing for the glory days of slavery. I just think that there was a time that, as you said, people knew their neighbors, towns themselves had individual identities. Um, you know, people could be from my little hometown and have strong opinions about the next little town seven miles away. And, and you know, they held those opinions for years and years and years. Um, but the thing too is this, the South being as agrarian as it was for so long, there's a real connection to land and to place. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of people I know who literally live in the same house now that their family's been in for seven generations. Um, I'm visiting with my mother now at the house right across the street has the original wallpaper that was hung in the 1850s because no one in the family is willing to take it down. Um, so there is this sense of connectivity and we relied on the land. We depended on it. And I disagree with this conceit that one should only write what they know. I mean, that, that would lead to a pretty brief writing career for me. I'll speak for myself personally, but if you know the place in which you are setting these novels, um, if you're lucky and you're good enough at it, you can get what I consider one of the, the highest um, laudits, which is that place is so real. It's almost a character in the book. And I think that that comes from a deep and true understanding, not just of the physical descriptors of the place, the mountains, valleys, rivers, desert plains, whatever the case, but how the people who live there relate to them. Um, and if you can create that and encapsulate that, you can educate people on the other side of the planet who know nothing at all about the rural South, let's say, or uh, the Southwest and make them feel it. And, and that is such a great thing to strive to do. I, I always put, for me personally, character first and, and then story and only slightly below that is place, but place matters so much and it's so important to get it right. And um, I feel like vestiges of the South that you remember so vividly are still here and should be honored. Um, and yet at the same time, I doubt any part of the country is changing as quickly as the South Charlotte, North Carolina is the number two financial center in America, which is unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, 30 years ago, that, that nobody could have gotten their heads around that. Um, so you've got this whole new South. I hate that term. Um, but as the region becomes homogenized, there are people that still cherish um, what it means to be part of these small towns and tied to the land. Um, you know, the, the farm that I grew up on, um, the boundaries hadn't changed since a grant from the king and Cornwallis camped on it during the Revolutionary War. And, and then we lost it when I was seven. And, and I still feel that pain even now. And that was 48 years ago. I'm sure that that's not uniquely um, real to the South, but it is for me. And that's what I try to bring into the books. Uh, 
Thank you. I, I, I was really following both of you very much there. I, I appreciate it. Um, to me, uh, first of all, I want to say that my experience has been the deep south versus the other south. And I think there is a difference. There's, there's a little difference. And uh, it was interesting to hear you talk about it. I, I got to reflecting on that. But as far as sense of place, uh, I just uh, wrote a piece from, for uh, Crime Reads, the online uh, site. It's part of LitHub. And uh, they asked me to write something about Texas Noir. I don't know why, but I said, hell yeah, I'll do it. So I just said, well, what, what does that even mean? And uh, so as I researched and I talked to uh, various people that are fairly well known, Annika Locke, Joe Lansdale, uh, you know, just to get their impressions of what was going on. And we, we kind of shared the same attitude that it shapes so much of what you decide to write about. And, and I, these things are not place, character, and plot. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, all black and white all the time. But for me, place influences character the way character influences, you know, storyline. And but they all are kind of mixed up. But so, but that's just the way I see it because I said earlier, I have a very strong sense of place having been displaced so many times. Uh, and I feel like it's true if, if, you can, if you can accurately portray an area, it gives some more credibility to what you're writing, I think. And that you have to be real careful about that. If you ever write about New Orleans, don't ever make a single mistake about a street name, a, a location, an attitude, or anything, because you will freaking hear about it. Um, hmm. But that's also, you know, so what? You, you can uh, make a few things up, which I have done before, because then nobody can challenge me as to where it is. But um, I, I find, anyway, I find it an important uh, element and that the South, draws me because I mostly live there. So does Texas, because I've also lived in Texas a pretty long time. And and I guess that is part of the South. In some ways, is it the Southwest? Is it the South? We all know that that changes the way, like what the hell is Florida even? And, uh, <laughs> but I, I agree that it has a huge influence on the characters we build. And we, we can't be bound just by who we know, because then we'd never had, everything would be so boring. Uh, but we make people up, we make things happen. Uh, I think the part that maybe I draw from, from my own experience the most though, is recognizing and being able to describe a city, a state or anything. So I've lived in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, passed on Mississippi for some reason and, uh, but, and even Arkansas, but that's what I basically know. I've been to lots of other parts of the world too, but uh, but anyway, I find what, what you all are both saying to be true to me as well, because I think a sense of place, everybody always talks about how that's important in other forms of literature. And uh, even in nonfiction writing, if you're writing a, a piece about somebody and they live in a particular area that's important, uh, you would want to get a sense of where they live in there. It would need to be really accurate and would show what, what influenced them growing up. So can I, can I weigh in before we move on to the next question? Um, because I listen to you guys and it, you know, the, the noggin starts uh, working. Here's the other part of this, right? I mean, um, if tension drives story, what, place has more tension than the South. I mean, because, you know, obviously you've got the slavery and the racial strife, but you've got entrenched poverty. I mean, deep Appalachian entrenched poverty, and you've got all this new wealth. I mean, forget the, you know, the old landed wealth, but you've this new wealth, the, the banking wealth, the corporate wealth. And I love, um, I mean, tension is what drives these stories. We all know this. So if you can have a, a simmering tension in the setting that goes even deeper than what's going on through characters, you know, put these people into motion against these long lasting divides between, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I can point at neighborhoods a half mile from where I'm right now, where there are black families, you know, dirt, dirt poor in these horrible homes, but I can go an hour West and find 
white families in Forgotten Hollows up in the mountains that are even more desperate. And so it's just a it's just a target rich environment to build tension beneath what's happening with the characters themselves. That's that's well said, John. And I suppose there's a, a lot of uh, inherent contradiction and, and tension that radiates from that as well. Um, but, you know, I, I want to make sure we have a, a little bit of time maybe for each of you to talk specifically about your books. Uh, I know that uh, the audience is going to be interested in learning a, a little bit more about uh, your novel and, and what makes you tick as uh, a writer. So in uh, the time that we have remaining, I'd like to maybe just segue a little bit in our conversation in that direction. Um uh, and actually maybe pull together a few threads here because uh, it's been so interesting to hear you talk about mystery, uh, the mystery of violence, uh, what it expresses about us, what it perhaps it expresses about uh, uh, the region. And uh, for that, maybe um, I'd like to go back to um, the gospel according to uh, Billy the Kid. Uh, it's very striking to me, Dennis, in your work, uh, you have this pitch perfect dialogue, uh, whether you're taking us through uh, dialogue to Hispanic culture or to, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Scotch-Irish uh, culture. And so I think that the book brings us into roots and spirituality and places uh, that we might not expect even though the title is kind of a, a poker tell there. Um, maybe you could just speak briefly to uh, your interest in the spiritual uh, side of Billy and the Irish roots of a character about which not a whole lot is, is, is known ultimately. Well, there's an assumption that uh, Billy the Kid was originally Henry McCarty uh, grew up in, well, didn't grow up, but was born in, in New York, which may or may not be true. And that's part of the mystery of this particular book. Uh, but as, a, and in, in my book, Billy is an Irish Catholic, uh, maybe a fallen away Irish Catholic, but nonetheless, uh, so, uh, you know, so his families did come from Ireland and the language is there in, in the speech, et cetera. Uh, and if I'm an Irish Catholic, okay? Um, and my feeling about being Catholic, if you are born Catholic and you raised Catholic, it's, it's like being Jewish, you know? If, you were, if you're born a Jew and you decide to, uh, get out of Judaism, you know, you want, you foreclose that for some reason, you can't, you know, it's in your DNA. And if you, and uh, so it affects, it affects what you think about it, it affects how you grow, grow up, it, it affects your feelings of guilt as a Catholic. Everybody, the joke about Catholics is they have suffer more guilt than anybody else. And, and uh, so that certainly plays a, a part in Billy's life as he's growing up in this story. And um, as it turns out, you know, uh, Rod had talked about not knowing where, where the characters were going. I had no idea where Billy was going when I was started this novel. I was intrigued by him. I was intrigued by uh, the fact that uh, Billy the Kid had was so, so famous and yet we knew so little about him. In fact, we don't know almost nothing about him, but he has become the most famous outlaw in the world. And so I was writing about that and I wanted to start out with the Lincoln County War and the first half of the book probably is about the Lincoln County War. And I knew I was gonna get through that, but beyond that, I had no idea where it was going. And uh, there's a monastery uh, about an hour and a half away from uh, Santa Fe where my wife and I go occasionally and we go up there for retreats and it's a Benedictine monastery. And uh, I was up there for about a week and I was writing and working on Billy and I'm sitting in the chapel one morning and all of a sudden Billy steps over my shoulder and he says, hey, when are you gonna bring me here? And, and it was a revolutionary thought and, and in fact, okay, if you want to be here, what's going to happen? And so he started telling me, and this story takes 
a, you know, 180 degree. Well, it took a 460 degree uh, curve. And, uh, and it took me off to places I had no idea where it was going, but it did move into a uh, spiritual realm. And, uh, and, you know, I was talking earlier about, uh, you know, about our basic biology and, and the good and the evil. And in, in, if, if you can call them good and evil, you know, the Buddhists don't think about good and evil, you know, they just think about this is where things are. And Rod, uh, your character has a Buddhist tendencies and, and that certainly I think crows, uh, comes out in, in his behavior. Um, so, you know, there is a, if in our modern uh, non-Buddhist way, we do talk about good and we do talk about evil, but it, to me, it's all about, it's not about good and evil. It's about basic biology, uh, striving to uh, reach some kind of a spiritual level, you know, striving for God, if you want to put it that way. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Dennis. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, shift just a bit into nuts and bolts um, which I know readers also want to hear about. Um, I'm fascinated, Dennis, by what you just said about your character basically tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, listen to me. When are you going to bring me here? And as we, as writers, as we think about how the stories get built, how the stories get written, um, I'd like to ask you, John, about um, something that was briefly, briefly, briefly mentioned earlier, which is that um, you're a popular writer of thrillers. You probably, I'm guessing, have had the experience of, as you mentioned, running into someone who has the whole novel here, who has not gotten around to getting it down on paper yet, um, and therefore might be thinking that the writing of novels in general, or thrillers in particular, might be easier than you know that it actually is. Um, so what have you found to be true about writing about thrillers, perhaps in particular, if you'd like to speak to that, um, that those of us who love thrillers and read them, but don't write them, um, might not expect. What's fascinating to me about this, uh, this whole conversation is I'm looking at Dennis and Rod and, and realizing that the three of us have something in common. And that's that we make the stories up as we go. I think I can speak for both of you in saying that. I'm pretty sure I heard that. And yet my experience after years in this business and meeting a lot of writers is that there seems to be a pretty clean line between those who grope in hope, which is what I generally refer to it. You know, some people call it pantsing, you by the seat of your pants, and those that, that outline and know as soon as they begin the prose exactly how the story is going to go. I, I can't abide the thought of outlining um, a novel because... OK, first of all, any outline that I create is going to be a moot document 10 pages in because some better idea is going to come to me. And that's happened. Secondly, if you are wed to this outline and then you begin the real beauty of writing prose and I, I love attention to the language at that point, you're just making widgets. You know, where's the adventure? Where's the discovery? Um, I suspect that the outliners go to bed at, in greater peace than those of us who grow up in hope. I mean, I often wake up at three in the morning wondering how the hell I'm going to finish this book. But I think that my job is a lot more fun and it's definitely much more exciting. Now, exciting can be good and exciting can be bad. I want to spend an entire year uh, writing a novel, my fifth in the school of grow up and hope before I realized that 300 pages in, it wasn't working. And I ended up discarding an entire year's worth of effort. Uh, but what I learned um, and um Dennis talking about being tapped on the shoulder. Okay, this, this kind of ties in nicely because the joys of writing fiction in a discovery mindset is that you never know what wonderful discoveries are in store. So, you know, Dennis had this very major shift in, in probably where he thought the novel was going based on this idea of, of Billy the Kid tapping him on the shoulder. I experienced something very differently. Um, well, very similar, but also different. In this fifth novel, um, I thought I knew whose story I was telling, and uh, there was a small character off on the side, this young female detective, 
And the more I wrote the story and the more certain I became that it just wasn't what I, what I should be writing, I became more and more interested in this little bit character. And after a year, I realized that it was really and truly her story that I should be telling because the, the guy whose story I was trying to write was predictable and stale. And we've all seen him a hundred times, but this was a young woman who was willing to walk through fire for the right reasons. And those reasons were endlessly fascinating to me. And I realized I should have been telling her story all along. So uh, I threw away a year. Uh, I wrote a whole new novel with this young woman as the main character, and that became Redemption Road, which was my fifth novel. Um, and, and I'm talking so much, I forgot what your original question was. I guess the, you know, what is it like to write thrillers? I think that, uh, so nuts and bolts. It's important to understand that plot matters, but personal growth of the characters is equally important. The the thrillers that fall flat for readers are those books where the characters are the same on page one as they are on page 400. If the reader does not experience some significant change in the lives and perspectives and belief systems of these characters, the story is going to fall flat. So the trick for writing compelling literature um, Uh, well, I won't even speak to literature. That's big. The trick to writing compelling thrillers is to find a story that drags the reader through the pages and then wed that to a meaningful growth arc for one or hopefully more characters so that we experience the journey, we understand the journey, and then we remember the characters. Uh, And I'll give you, for instance, uh, I I love Pat Conroy. He and I were friends. And I read Prince of Tides when it first came out in 1986. I was 21 years old. I can't tell you the blow by blow of the plot for that story, but I remember the characters like I grew up next to them. And so if if a thriller writer can wed those two features, it's a good start. And then you add in these other things we're talking about, like place and tension and the, the you know, the love of language and all these things that we writers struggle with every day. Uh, and it becomes a really gratifying way to make a living. Um, but curse those outliners because they sleep well, damn them. Uh, they get up knowing exactly what they're going to do and they can write the book in five months. And I'm, you know, I don't have that, that gift. So anyway, that, that's what I have on, on that question. Thank you. Yeah. Sean, that reminds me of that description of, of uh, writing as being a, a guided dream, which I think it is for, for many of us who are gropers and hopers, as you put it. Um, so I, I, I don't, uh, I, I want to get in one more question and I, and I think our host might indulge us uh, with a little extra time here because we have a big panel. Um, Rod, I was hoping I might ask you specifically uh, about uh, how, I, I think this is a, a really wonderful and fascinating thing about your thriller. You bring uh, African spirituality into that. And so we hear, uh, there's a way in which uh, you're bringing in some of your nonfiction writing, uh, or at least, you know, your, your knowledge of those practices. And I think uh, it's one of the things when, when, when we read this novel, we can tell you're having a lot of fun discovering it in a certain way. Uh, and we see that in the dialogue and things that characters do that are surprising. And there's also uh, this interesting spiritual element. So um, maybe you could just speak briefly to uh, how that came to be. Sure. Uh, actually, <clears throat> as I'm thinking and hearing everybody else talk, I'm thinking <clears throat> there probably is a spiritual element in my book. And maybe that's one of the things I originally thought about, Jack, that would, because you you kind of want somebody to distinguish your character from the 5 million other ones that are out there and they should have some kind of uniqueness, but I was interested in that anyway. So it wasn't hard for me to do, but his dealing with, with with Zen and and so on and how he got to this voodoo village or this voodoo person helping him was very much drawn on my experience with American voodoo. I just want to, pause right there and say one of the reasons I like this genre is is as uh, somebody once described uh, Pablo Ignacio Taibo II, the Mexican writer who's really great, that uh, the police novel, he would mean these novels too, is the best genre. This was a a review in La Jornada uh, newspaper. The police novel is the best genre for describing social injustice, the abuse of power, the inequality that exists in a society. So what draws me to this genre is you you can explore all that. Of course, the South is a great place. I'm sure New Jersey is too, but 
I, I know about the South, so we can look at racism, corruption, evil, all those things, uh, and we should. And that's why I'm drawn to it because you want to, you know, to uh, put good and evil in conflict and find out who wins. They don't always win the same way. But uh, so part of that drew me to thinking about uh, uh, Jack is in a tight, tight spot coming out of almost getting, you know, uh, cut to pieces. And this guy comes along to help him who's from this nearby uh, little farm that he runs in South Carolina, kind of near Beaufort. And uh, and he fi finds himself there. So I drew on what I had learned. I had actually been to a place exactly like that. Uh, in, uh, it's called Oyotunji in South Carolina. And there's a village that was set up there in the 70s by some people that wanted to re restart true African voodoo in the US. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty damn interesting place. And uh, so at one point I stayed in a little place exactly like I described in the book, a very small shack. You didn't know what was going on outside really. And uh, some of the boys in the village sneaked in one night, do a snake in there, just you know, make it more interesting. And uh, I, and they thought it was funny. <laughs> uh, they got in some trouble for that, but, but I knew the religion, and I, I under, so I was able to create a character, and it might have been a little bit of a stretch putting in there, but it made sense to me because I could see how that would interact, uh, and it, it was in an uncomfortable way. You had to acknowledge that this guy who was running was helping a guy who was selling organ parts and body parts and or, or helping him do that and he had to face up to that and uh but it also saved jack's life it introduced him to another way of looking at the world and added another character to eventually help him through the rest of the novel and so i had no idea that was going to happen until it happened uh, I had no idea that Jack was going to realize at one point in a beach in Biloxi that this really wasn't about rescuing Rose, uh, Elle's daughter, the woman he was in love with, Elle. It was about his own daughter that he couldn't rescue. That just came out of nowhere also. And, uh, and I'm glad, you know, John is like it, right on cue, buddy, because I mean, I, if, I, I, if I'd applauded that, I would have never thought of that, ever. Uh, but I, I enjoyed putting that in there. And I also, to be honest, I wanted to put, and, and there's some voodoo elements in uh, South Kama America as well. Uh, one of the people in there is connected with this guy and that's how they rescue Jack out of this whole situation. So there's that thread as well. But I like presenting that religion, which I claim is a real lit religion that's been suppressed horribly over the years and distorted and everything else as just something that also exists. And, uh, and, and instead of like, woo, voodoo, it's like, here's a real thing. So, and that guy was very calm and he helped him and he was a good person and except for this one little detail. And mm -hmm. I enjoyed doing that. And I thought it kind of, uh, I like to add things if I can to a book that maybe people don't know about. Uh, it's good to bring them up and that makes it also propels me because it challenges your your imagination right off the spot and i do think you know as john was talking about uh that's what keeps you going you know that's that's why you, you do it kind of so speaking of things that keep us going um here is here in our last moments together on our panel um i'd like to invite each of you if you want to because i know that some writers um like to talk about the next book some writers really prefer not to um so i will leave that up to you anything you would like to say um what can you tell us and our viewers now about your next project? Um, Dennis, how about you? Would you like to start? Okay, uh, my next project is um, about another Irish kid. One grew up in Ireland during the time of the famine and uh, some things happen, uh, some unhappy things happen and he gets on a boat and comes to the United States and, and Curiously, he winds up in the Southwest 
uh, as a he's an outlander himself, a you know third class citizen, and he goes to the to the outer reaches. Uh, I have I have a few notions about where it's going, uh, but I know that uh, my character will tell me where it's going. He's uh, he's already thrown in a bunch of surprises, and uh, I ha I have a, a slight vision of where he may end up in the end, but he may not. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, it's it will be another Western genre story ultimately. Cool, John. How about you? Well, I'm I'm one of these guys that doesn't like to talk about things too much. I think it steals my my mojo. Um, but I, I'll say that it's a. I, I generally avoid sequels um, mainly because I don't often want to revisit the same characters. I, I like finding new people uh, so that I can tell those stories and discovering the character is a big deal for me in the process. But um, that's why I don't really do a series. I mean, I think series fiction is really fun and it's great. I just haven't fell, fallen in love with somebody. I want to write about book after book after book. That said, uh, what I'm doing now is a sequel to Redemption Road. Uh, it was the first and only female protagonist I've ever written. And I just, I don't know, it's weird. I've, I've written The Unwilling since then and The Hush since then. And yet this, um, this character just keeps telling me that there are stories that we need to share. And so uh, that's what I'm working on, a, a sequel to Redemption Road. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Rob, how about you? Uh, I'm in an interesting place. I just finished, a, um, I would I say, literary novel, just to distinguish it, that I've been working on for quite a few years about post-Katrina New Orleans. And I just sent it off to my publisher. Uh, I hope they can swallow it. Uh, but uh, I think my next book, because I've written two kind of literary ones. One, my first novel is called Karina's Way. It was set in New Orleans. Uh, it won a little uh, a pin award, and but then I got into this other thing, which I really like doing, but I like both. So that's another interesting thing for a writer. What if you're torn between kind of two different kinds of books? What what you do? And I know that happens to a lot of a lot of writers. Uh, so I've got a literary one. I hope will come out maybe next year. My next, I'm going to do one more. I think on these, I was debating whether to do one more, but I finally was hit with the idea, you know, when I re was reassessing my like ridiculous life. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe it's time for Jack to fall into a big hole and try to get out and come on onto something. I don't know where it's gonna go, but I, so I think I'll do one more uh, of these. And then uh, more than three in a series, I don't think I could, I don't think I could handle that, but I would, I think I should do one more. Cool. This all sounds great, thank you. Well, we are come to the uh, end of our, our time uh, with our panel today. Uh, it, it's been terrific and inspiring to hear all of you talk about your process, to talk about these novels, uh, and to give us some real insights to your, your passion for writing uh, and for taking us on this journey. So uh, thank you all so much uh, for, for your, your time and, and super thoughtful discussion and responses. Uh, it's, it's been a terrific pleasure. And we look forward to the next projects in all of the different shapes that they take. I think that that's it. Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great Thank pleasure. you very much. I enjoyed it. Very much. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us for 21 Conversations. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like and share with your friends and fellow readers. One final reminder that Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing together readers and writers throughout the year at zero cost to our community. Please help Greensboro Bound maintain that commitment with a sustaining or one-time gift now. The number to text to give and our website are on your screen. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person next year.